Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back. We have an excellent uh, interview today. We have Andrew Idleman. He's a partner at Fuerst, Idleman, David, and Joseph, a Miami-based attorney and specialist in money transmission and anti-money laundering law. Welcome to the podcast, Andrew. Thanks for having me. So first, can you give us a little bit of, of your background? Personally, I'm an investor in gold money. It's very analogous to a sure. major case that you handle. Sure. So I am a criminal defense lawyer by background. I graduated law school in 2004. Um, I was doing typical criminal defense work, violent crimes, drug crimes, sex crimes, you name it. I did it. I left the firm that I was with right out of law school and um, I, I met Mitchell first, who's my partner now. Um, and I was introduced to more of the white collar criminal work that I, that I did for quite some time. Um, the first case that he had me working on actually involved somebody who was manufacturing a fake version of Botox. Uh, they were prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Florida. Uh, and the FDA participated in the criminal investigation. Uh, Eagold, uh, the case fell on my desk right after Christmas in 2005 um, when the company had its first bank account seized. Um, I represented Eagold in the forfeiture case that came out of the bank seizure um, as well as part of the criminal prosecution and the appeal that was taken to the DC Circuit relating to uh, part of the seizure issue. We made good law in the DC Circuit, but that was pretty much the end of my involvement with Eagle. But what Eagle did introduce me to was two critical things. One was the concept of digital currency, which was the first time that I ever called money into question. I had never done that before. Um, and secondly was uh, how money transmitting businesses are regulated in the United States. And what I started seeing and paying attention to was in the years after 9-11, there was a wave of criminal prosecutions, Eagle being one, um, dealing with the concept of an unlicensed money transmitting business. And after 9-11 and the Patriot Act, that the 1960 statute was changed um, to eliminate the specific intent requirement. It became a general intent statute, meaning that the government didn't have to prove anybody's guilty mind in order to prosecute the case. Um, but in these criminal cases between about 2003 and 2009, again, Eagle being one, um, the criminal litigation typically focused on what's a money transmitting business? How are we going to define that as a society? And then, you know, if we do have a broad definition, um, are these different licensing statutes going to apply to all of them? And, and that was a, a very good education for me, and it got me ready to represent some of the Bitcoin companies that I'm working with now. Because, you know, a, as we've seen, FinCEN is regulating them as money transmitters and is applying the concept of money transmission very, very broadly um, to eliminate certain exceptions that used to apply. For instance, if a company was acting as a payment processor or even just a seller of currency, a currency exchanger. Those things were typically regulated as things other than money transmitters, but now that's all falling into the money transmission category. And during your presentation down here at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference, uh, you talked about just how broad FinCEN wants to define this money transmission activity, Yeah, that it could even be smoke signals. Right. Uh, and that, that's a direct quote from one of these FinCEN yeah. uh, officials, right? Yeah. Could, well, could you go into that a little bit about how critical the activity component of this money transmission is and how broad they're trying to interpret it? Well, I mean, they are interpreting it as broadly as possible. Um, as it relates to Bitcoin, there really doesn't seem to be much of a limit in terms of how broad the money transmission definition is. There used to be exceptions for, let's say, payment processors, and, and the currency exchanger is typically regulated as a currency exchanger. 
But now companies that are simply buying and selling Bitcoin uh, with their customers or, or, or a company that you can go to to buy Bitcoin just to yourself without there being a third party participant in that transaction, even that's being regulated as money transmission by FinCEN. I can guess as to why they're doing it. They're casting a very wide net, possibly while they're waiting for more specific laws to develop in Congress. This seems to be a good way for FinCEN just to tap on the brakes of the development of the industry, which happens for a lot of reason. I mean, you know, some some good and some, you know, maybe not so good. But the U.S. government is never going to let a drastic change occur if it can avoid it, because it can be upsetting. It can upset the, um, the markets. And um, there's a lot of markets. And this may just be a way for, for FinCEN to, again, tap on the brakes and try to gain some control over a very rapidly expanding business. What area of the money transmission law do you think is kind of the most worrisome? I mean, we've got these no specific intent criminal statutes, yeah. a very wide net. Are we looking at potential like criminal like constitutional issues uh, well, in terms of due process? Or are things void for vagueness? Are they overly broad? Do they not pass constitutional muster? Are they just not defined? For example, we have dollar limits on a lot of these things, yeah. but we don't even know what the definition of a dollar is under federal law. Right. It's unintelligible, right. uh, according to Dr. Vieira, uh, who practices before the U.S. Supreme Court, four degrees from Harvard, has written the leading treatise, uh, Pieces of Eight, yeah. Uh, seventeen hundred page uh, monetary jurisprudence treatise. So, where where are kind of the issues, and what can the industry do? I okay. mean, should we be seeking advisory opinions uh, in some cases? Well, there's a lot of questions there, and I'll do my best to answer them serially. Many of these issues, many of the legal issues that you're talking about now, including the constitutionality of the general intent aspect of the 1960 statute, were raised in these prosecutions between 2003 and 2009, and they didn't go very well. The problem with the way that the 1960 statute is prosecuted is that it ultimately puts criminal court judges in the position of writing new law applying these very broadly written statutes to some very technologically revolutionary business models and transaction models. And across the board, the criminal court judges have said, yes, that's money transmission, and that's governed by the 1960 statute, and the government doesn't need to prove your intent in order to convict you of having violated it. And that's just how it's been across the board. And I, and I think, you know, Charlie Shrem raised a similar defense um, in a motion to dismiss, and that was denied as well. Criminal court judges are going to interpret the 1960 statute as broadly as it's written, and it's written really broadly. And basically it says that if you're in the business of transmitting money, you're a money transmitter. And regardless of what the IRS has said, they're treating Bitcoin as money in most cases. But when we're talking about the definition of money, even one of the FinCEN officers, he told you that if you're transmitting value, whatever value is, because it's subjective, yeah. based on individual feeling, if you're transmitting that via smoke signal, he says that's still money transmission. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting. There is that thought process, and I, I can expand on that more. Um, but, you know, at the same time, Texas and Kansas have taken very different positions. Than New York? Well, or from each other. No, the, the, Texas and Kansas have both come out with advisory opinions saying that Bitcoin is not money and therefore we're not going to regulate you as money transmitters. But those are outliers in terms of what the other regulators have done. Yeah, but Texas is big. And oh, yeah. The only other real regulator seems to be Lasky in New York. Right. You know, we can get into those proposed regulations. Um, I think that ultimately with Lossky, you may have a situation where, you know, as a society, I think that we need to make a decision as to whether we want to, every time a new technology comes out, write new laws to govern that technology or um, apply existing laws to the new technology. And there's never really a perfect answer. Um, there's a, cr a criminal case from the U.S. Supreme Court back in the 40s. It was called United States versus McBoyle, okay? And in the McBoyle case, um, a, a person had stolen an airplane, had brought it across state lines, and uh, was prosecuted with having uh, shipped a stolen motor vehicle in interstate commerce. And his defense in the case was that this is an airplane. It's not a motor vehicle. 
and all the courts to look at it until the Supreme Court said, well, it moves and it's got a motor, it's a motor vehicle. And the Supreme Court said, hell no to that. And in that case, the Supreme Court required the government to write new law governing the, the shipping of stolen airplanes in interstate commerce. Because motor vehicle was overly broad exactly. and therefore exactly. uh, didn't but, pass constitutional muster. Right. And so that's great on the one side constitutionally. But then on the new side, you take a guy like Mosky saying, OK, I'll write new laws for that. And then, well, now we're dealing with that issue. Isn't that what's really difficult with Bitcoin is actually pinning it down definitionally about what it exactly is? Well, in terms of regulation, what we're seeing in the U.S., given that there's a number of different federal agencies to come out and comment on Bitcoin, Bitcoin is going to be regulated not based on Bitcoin as a thing, but based on how it's used. So the SEC can regulate the issuance of, of Bitcoin Bitcoin-related securities, and if Bitcoin is being used itself as a security, CFTC can come out and regulate it as a commodity. FinCEN can come out and regulate it as money transmission. But can't that be overly broad and therefore not pass constitutional muster? Well, it's not an issue of the breadth because all of those agencies certainly have the right to regulate in the Bitcoin space. Uh, Do they? Under the supreme law of the land, they may not. Well, if they are going to regulate Bitcoin depending on how it's used, that's one thing. The problem is going to arise if they're regulating it inconsistently. So if one federal agency is saying something completely different from another, and it puts the Bitcoin-related company into a position where he cannot possibly comply with both, that is what's going to raise the issues. I don't see there being an issue of the power grab itself. I see the issues coming when it becomes impossible to comply with both. One of the interesting things, though, about the blockchain is, first, is that it's just the organization of zeros and ones. Yes. Second is that you can include in the blockchain specifically organized information. For example, people have included prayers in the blockchain. Yes. People have included political speech in the blockchain. And last I checked, in the Supreme Law of the Land, it says that Congress shall make no law regarding the freedom of speech or of the press. Yeah. And so when we're looking at Bitcoin in the mid-90s, Zimmerman fought the crypto wars, and the U.S. Supreme Court upheld cryptography as freedom of speech, under freedom of speech protections yes. under the Munitions Act. Yes. So is not the argument that Bitcoin is merely speech, which is what it is at its yeah. most basic component, and yeah. I gave a presentation about this at the Bitcoin conference in San Jose in 2013, you know, what is Bitcoin? It's, it's speech at its most basic core. You could say the same thing about money, about money generally. That really money, when I give you a dollar, the dollar is just a piece of paper, but it memorializes a it memorializes value. It memorializes the transaction itself. Yeah, but we have constitutional jurisdiction with money. Mm -hmm. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5, to coin money and regulate the value thereof. And notice it says to coin, not to print. Mm -hmm. And then we have the limitations in Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, that no state shall make anything legal tender except it's gold and silver, right. which is interesting because how do we make Federal Reserve notes legal tender when they're not gold and silver? Only the states can make something legal tender. So how's the federal government making anything legal tender? These are very good questions. And unfortunately, I don't have the, the Well, are they, just, are they just acting unconstitutionally or do they actually have any jurisdiction anywhere? to make stuff legal tender because under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, no state shall, under Article, uh, under the 10th Amendment, any powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states or to the people themselves. Where does the federal government get authority to make anything legal tender, to define what money is? The Constitution doesn't even define what money is. If we're going to have money transmission, we need to have clear definitions, particularly when there are when you have no specific intent, criminal penalties for felonies yeah. for constitutional due process. I mean, we got the fourth, fifth, sixth amendments to deal with and comply with also. Yeah. At yeah. least constitutionally. I mean, how many shields of the Constitution can get raised in this area? All of them. Um, But again, I think a lot of these issues have been called into question already in the courts uh, in a number of different capacities. Um, From what I understand, and I haven't looked at a lot of these issues in a while, they haven't gone well. A lot of the issues have been raised by tax protesters believing that the federal government... Yeah, but but is this an area where perhaps the Bitcoin Foundation or the Chamber of Digital Commerce could step in and be seeking advisory opinions 
so that we're not actually dealing with bad facts, mm -hmm. you know, because in, in many cases, bad facts make bad law. Correct. And like, why should we be letting someone like Charlie Shrem uh, be the one that's like yeah. a test case or a guinea pig? Like, why why not be seeking advisory opinions in this area? Is well, that something that could be a potential solution well, for the industry? Companies are doing that. And that's how FinCEN is coming out with its various opinions. Well, no, I, I don't mean just opinions from FinCEN. I mean seeking advisory opinions from district court judges. Oh, no, that doesn't exist. The district court judges do not have jurisdiction to write advisory opinions of that nature. The Constitution requires them only to issue opinions when there's an actual case in controversy. To be settling cases and controversies? Right, exactly. There has to be a case in controversy, which is why, with respect to money transmission... Well, could, could the case in controversy be saying, I don't think I need to register as a money transmitter with FinCEN? It would have to be the other way around. It would be FinCEN requiring you... Well, they, well, they have with their regulatory uh, in, in, opinions, but haven't they? Th but there's no case in controversy until there's some sort of an enforcement action against you. And you could even try to sue the government um, for having issued this advisory opinion in a way that you believe to be unlawful. Most well, well, wouldn't the advisory opinions in a way be a prior restraint on the freedom of speech and how one wants to use this blockchain technology? Theoretically, yes. But again, most district court judges will not take on that case until it's, uh, the term is ripe. And they will not deem the case to be ripe until there's an enforcement action against you. But you've got potential criminal statutes that is prior restraint you're, you're, on your speech, you're, though. You are absolutely right. But again, even with the, some of the civil rights cases going back to the uh, during Jim Crow, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, um, a lot of those types of First Amendment issues weren't they couldn't really raise them until, unfortunately, people were hurt and arrested. And that's just the way that, uh, that the Constitution limits the jurisdiction that district court judges have. There has to be some sort of an enforcement action. And so would you say this is one of the main reasons that we have such a chilling effect in the U.S., at least regulatorily, on the Bitcoin industry? I, I think that there's something to be said about that. But I would imagine it's something that the framers of the Constitution brought into question when they were dealing with that. They wrote the cases and controversies requirement into the Constitution to limit the power that district court judges have. Because ultimately you're talking about something that's either legislative in nature or regulatory in nature. So that jurisdiction has been given specifically to the Congress and to the executive. Or in some cases it hasn't because Congress shall make no law. Right. regarding freedom of speech. I mean, unless there's an incitation for imminent violence, where's the clear and compelling interest to regulate this form of political or religious speech? Well, again, you have a checks and balances issue. Each of the branches of the government is designed to be a check on the power of the others. Which is one of the primary problems we've got where we don't have a definition of the dollar and we have legal tender being made that doesn't have any constitutional authorization. Right. Absolutely. And so that takes the power of the purse and gives it to different areas of the government well, that, or exactly. not even governmental actors than what was intended by the framers to begin with. Right. But again, it's another good example of a check and a balance where the Congress is supposed to be writing appropriations laws which give the different federal agencies the money that they need in order to operate. But again, the various federal agencies are at the same time under the power of the executive branch of the government, the president. And so that in and of itself is another good example of a, of a check and a balance that's embedded in the, in the Constitution. So we've got another very interesting issue because with a lot of these money transmission laws, like currency transaction reports, the $10,000, sure. right? But what is a dollar? Under 18 uh, USC 5101 through 5118, we've got one ounce of silver equaling one dollar. We got fifty dollars equaling one ounce of gold. We've got uh, one dollar Federal Reserve notes. So, like which particular form of value or dollar sign or I mean, which one do we use on these reports, and why do we use that particular one? As far as the dollars are concerned? Yeah, I mean, because the 1792 Coinage Act, it was 371.25 grains of fine silver was yeah. the definition of a dollar. And we have the term dollar used in the Constitution in multiple areas, like the slave provision. And that was hotly debated. So, I mean, the definition of a dollar for these money transmission laws, I mean, especially when we're talking about potential criminal penalties, right. uh, I think it's very important that we have due process in terms of notice of yeah. what that term means in Congress. Right. Right? I, I mean, I, like, what what do we use for it? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, shouldn't it be clear, though? 
hypothetically, academically speaking, yes, it should. Or do we just have very, very fuzzy criminal law in no, the U.S.? it's not fuzzy. It's just broad. The, and inconsistent? In some cases, they're inconsistent. But the inconsistency really only raises a constitutional level when, it, when again, it puts somebody in a position where he can't possibly comply with both. But the laws are written very generally. And um, unfortunately, money transmission is one of them. And it's being interpreted in the broadest possible way right now, with respect to Bitcoin, at least. Switching gears, what about self-incrimination and key disclosure laws? Yeah, uh, is there anything you'd like to talk about in that particular area? So I've had cases where, um, and it does raise very interesting Fifth Amendment concerns, the Barry Bonds case involved something along those lines where um, his personal trainer was required by a judge to disclose certain information about him and he refused to do it and was ultimately held in contempt. And during the Bonds case, the trainer did, I think, 18 months behind bars simply because he refused to testify and they were trying to compel him to testify. But similar issues exist in the, in the Bitcoin space. And I've had cases where clients have been ordered to turn over, uh, or at least requested in a grand jury investigation to turn over PGP keys, for instance, uh, private keys. They refuse to do it. And ideally there, you can come up with some sort of a compromise with the government where maybe the client would open or decrypt one document at a time, you know, with maybe somebody from the FBI watching over the process. That's one way to compromise. But, yeah, it's, it raises significant Fifth Amendment concerns, very significant. I was actually uh, presenting to a major bank with members of the FBI and uh, IRS criminal investigations who works counterterrorism, and the uh, special agent from the IRS was talking about, I think, a child porn case yeah. where they had, had the computer at the border. They had asked the subject to enter the decryption password, which he did. They found the illicit material on the computer. And then I think the FBI agent inadvertently unplugged the computer. Oh, God. And so they, like, plug it back in and try to boot it up. And they're like, well, put the encryption key in again. And he refused to do it. And I think the special agent said that he was protected against putting that encryption key in uh, because of self-incrimination. So it's very interesting. We have the FBI director calling for Apple to build back doors into their encryption. Yeah. We have the NSA with Snowden uh, revelations where all of this has been tapped into compromising the data of major corporations leading to large-scale uh, identity theft and potential personal information breaches. And so the market is just going to be moving in that direction of securing data sure. anyway. Sure. And so I think this is kind of a big, perfect storm all brewing up. we got money transmission that's a form of speech, and it, but it's protected by private keys that puts it beyond the reach. And, oh, sure. And, and sure. I mean, we, we've really got kind of a big mess brewing, don't we? Well, it's a brave new world. Uh, you know, I, I do know that the government is very actively watching the Bitcoin space very actively watching it. They're very familiar with the blockchain technology. And these are agents who, under federal code, have sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, yeah. so help them God, right? right? Like, they have sworn that oath. Okay? Right, and I'll, I'll tell you that the meaning of a lot of these terms that are embedded in the Constitution, there's never going to be one clear-cut answer for them. That's, you know, the Supreme Court deals with that sort of thing every single day and you can have nine different supreme court justices each having their own rules of how terms in the constitution should be interpreted from the most conservative to the most liberal and you will have that as long as the united states is a country it could go on like that for hundreds of years where these basic core terms there's always going to be issues of fact coming up that are interpretable and they'll just change Plessy versus Ferguson, Correct. Brown versus Board of Education. Right. Like, they'll just change right. their, well, their previous decisions. Yeah, and, and, and that's why it just shows how complex these, sometimes these very basic terms can really turn out. Money transmission is a perfect example. It's just two words. But exactly how we interpret it will be the subject of debate, and litigation, and as new products are developed, there's going to be new lawyers coming in to write opinions for those new companies, and it's going to go on like that, just based on this term money transmission, conceivably forever. 
Now, what's interesting when we look throughout all of history, when we have this currency crises and financial turmoil, like we had in 2007, like we had at the founding of the U.S., like we had with the reign of terror, like we had in Weimar, Germany, societies, they're posed with, you know, two potential outcomes, repression or regeneration. Right. And so it looks like the U.S. is being posed with this issue. Do we make it so that you can be held in jail, contempt of court, no ability to challenge your detention or appeal for not disclosing speech that they can't prove that you absolutely have? Because there's possible deniability with whether you have a private key or not. So, you know, the ultimate form of legally sanctioned tyranny yeah. looks to be an outcome. Well, or, you know, the U.S. could go the other route and have a much more free and open society in terms of speech. Yeah. Well, listen, it's just never going to be perfect. The system wasn't designed to be perfect. It was designed to be flexible. And it was designed for there to be, you know, give and take between fostering innovation and making sure that the people who are affected by these various innovations are, are protected. Um, you know, money is another good example. We want to try to loosen the market as much as we can so that new businesses can come into play, but we want to make sure that they're not allowing, you know, money laundering violations to occur and, you know, bad people in bad countries to have access to financial services, et cetera, et cetera. And it's constantly developing and it's never going to be perfect. And as soon as we get a system and the laws are written, the technology is going to move forward and the laws that are written today are going to be dinosaurs. And that's just the job that the government has in front of it. it is a, it's, it's essentially a thankless position to be in. Well, and, and I let the, the FBI special agents and the IRS criminal agent uh, special agent know, like, look, you guys have dragons out there. Yeah. There are bad people. Oh, yeah. There are they some are. really, really bad people out yeah. there. And they pose a significant threat to society. Yes. And, and our law enforcement, for the most part, they're hunting those bad people. Yeah. They are, I think, doing a very good job. Yeah. Uh, I have lots of family that are military and law enforcement and stuff like that. But at the same time, we have things like the Constitution to restrain yes. that huge amount of power. Like Justice Roberts, he, in his confirmation hearings, he was talking about how you have the full force and might of the U.S. government and all of the military machinery and everything, and he, as a lawyer, can stand and hold that violence in abeyance. Right. That's the power of the rule yeah, of law. it is. And if we don't have the rule of law, what does that bode for our society? It's, again, it's it's never going to be perfect. It's just not. It, it's never going to be perfect. And, and one person's interpretation of perfection may be completely different than the next guy's. But it, it is, a, I think it's a system that's designed to be flexible in nature, to take into consideration all of these wonderful opportunities and to try to help protect everybody from the bad things that can happen too. It needs to be flexible. It needs to give and take. And there's always going to be things that they do wrong, but there's hopefully going to be things that they do right also. And at the end of the day, they'll counterbalance one another. We're kind of getting a little long on the podcast, on the interview. We're getting into just stuff that is really, you know, this this is what a lot of, a lot of people kind of get inspired about when they think yeah. of going to law school is yeah. dealing with these real fundamental tectonic yeah. areas of the law, which really just represents the values that we as a society hold. Do we do we encourage freedom of speech or do we throw Galileo under house arrest? Well, you know, do, we're, 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 we're right now we're sitting in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and all of these issues that we're talking about become that much more complex when we start talking about them in the sense of international law, the relationships between the various countries who do business with one another, the complication that arises when a company in a nation that has a currency control in place needs to access some sort of a product or service in the United States. The international movement of money, the money laundering risks that occur, the treaties that exist between the nations, all of these come Tax into play. Tax information oh exchange God. agreements. All of them. All of them. I mean, it's all part, I think, of just humanity's, uh, humanity's journey from the swamps to the stars. Yeah. You know, we, we learn by our own experience. We, we make mistakes yeah. that result from bad ideas. You know, we really bad mistakes like Mao and Hitler right. and Stalin. Right. Uh, we make we make good choices like 
uh, Isaac Newton is master of the mint, developing the gold standard. Uh, the founding fathers with constitutional protections and provisions that have led to a free and open society right. that has really blessed the world with democratic-based government and rule of law. Right. Uh, what are you most optimistic about in this space? All right, so that's a you really, know, that like to, really, to close this off. Yeah, I mean, right, what so, are you optimistic so let, about? Let, let me let me answer that because I've done a lot of thinking about that. The first time I saw Vitalik Buterin speak, it was a very um, enlightening experience for me, for a number of different reasons. First of all, Ethereum just blew me away. When you think about the fact that it was last January, he was 19 at the time. And you take a step back and you think about the perspective that a 19-year-old has on the planet that we live in, and the United States, for instance. A 19-year-old would have been, at the time, maybe seven when 9-11 occurred. And a 19-year-old doesn't have the same appreciation for institutions that I do, and I'm only 35. But I'm 35, and I can remember a time when people didn't unanimously hate banks. And I'm 35, and I can remember a time when People had pride and, and felt a very strong feeling of patriotism. I can remember when the Berlin Wall fell, and I can remember how I felt, you know, watching President Reagan speak to those people the way that he did and directly lead to the end of communism. I can remember that. 19-year-old has no recollection of that. He wasn't even alive when that occurred. At the same time, a 19-year-old for his entire existence has been plugged into Facebook, has been plugged into the Internet, has received throughout his existence an unprecedented amount of information, good and bad. What I think we're seeing now, both in the Bitcoin space and, and elsewhere, in these millennials who we like to talk about, is that they're calling things into question. They're, they're raising questions about these institutions. They're raising questions about banks. They're raising questions about our government. They're raising questions about money. You know, that's what we've been talking about this whole time. What's money? Can I make it better? Can I make it more efficient? And um, I think that all of that is the, is, is the product of just this unfiltered fire hose of information that's been fed to them throughout their existence. And as much as we can say about millennials being this or millennials being that, I think that some of the things that they're doing with Bitcoin-related technology, is it's, it's awesome, and it's going to change the world. If the Bitcoin community can accomplish 10% of the things that it wants to accomplish, the world as we know it, I think, in 35 years from now, is going to be just drastically different, as, at least as far as the way that we, that we do business with one another. And I think that's awesome. I'd have to agree with you. We had the Gutenberg Press romantic novels, 150 years later, the yeah. scientific journal, which introduced to the world a new form of argument, you know, led to the rise of the natural philosophers. The brightest minds, the brightest scientists, Copernicus wrote a treatise on interests and money, 185 IQ. Newton developed the gold standard, 195 IQ. Two standard deviations higher, Johann van Goethe, absolute polymath. In Faust Part Two, he writes all about the negative effects to society in poetic form yeah. uh, when we debase the, the currency unit. With our modern day people, you know, like Vitalik and Adam Back, repression or regeneration. And, you know, all of these democratic forms of government, you know, we say that our laws are, are open and that uh, we're able to have community government, you could say. But when we look at the new form of argument that we have that the Internet has introduced, things like GitHub, on GitHub we have things that are called diffs. There are differences in the software code. We see what's added or subtracted, one's in red, one's in green, and so yeah. we're, we're able to see the exact differences that are made. Complete transparency in the form of argument on this version control. And the law is a form of version control. But we have to pass the law to find out what's in it before we get the diff. As programmers, we take this ability to have a diff for granted, and yet no democracy in the world offers us this form of argument. Right. I think we're going to see the Internet in this information age revolution that's coming, you know, this change from the agricultural to the industrial age and now from the industrial age to the information age. It's coming. It's been introduced by technology. It just is what it is. It's going to work itself out. Humanity's going to hopefully not destroy itself in the process. And we see this rising generation that are digital natives like Vitalik uh, taking these tools and a building term. a new world. Yeah. 
uh, with them. Yeah. With Bitcoin, I think that it all comes down to the open source nature of it because it allows all of that genius to participate on the same platform and everybody can make it better. Everybody can put their collective genius together. And and they all have access to all of the source code all of the time. Right, exactly. So there's complete transparency in right. that sense. And, and that's why, I mean, you look at the state of the Bitcoin space, it's moving so fast. And I think it's specifically because of that. It's allowing all of this genius to work together. Even people who've never even met one another, they're communicating with the same language, they're all putting their genius in, in, the, in as hard as they can. You know, fortunately, there are you know VC firms that are backing a lot of this now with real money, and um, it's racing forward. And from a regulatory perspective, it's just awesome to be a part of. It's really fun. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us, delving into some of these more philosophical or legal <laughs> issues, the moral issues, uh, the optimism for the future despite uh, all the change that we're in. Uh, we've had Andrew Ittleman, partner at Fuerst Ittleman, David and Joseph, a leading money transmission attorney, uh, criminal defense attorney. Thanks for being on the podcast Th with us. Thanks for having me. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. <laughs>